When you think about Theodore Roosevelt, you probably think about the mountains or out west. But would you believe in 1902, he was in a swamp in the South Carolina Low Country, visiting one of the ruins of the first South Carolina settlements. Today, tucked back off of a busy road, you too can walk in his footsteps while visiting the Colonial Dorchester State Historic Site. This settlement came into existence in 1696 as the third settlement in South Carolina after a small group of missionary settlers acquired 4,050 acres of the land along the north side of the Ashley River near present-day Somerville, South Carolina. Upon their arrival, South Carolina was home to several indigenous peoples. When the settlers arrived to the swampy Charlestown outback, it was as wild as the Congo. There, they found mammoth trees, prehistoric reptiles, and feared tribes. Because these God-fearing settlers, including Reverend Joseph Lord, originated from a small town in Massachusetts, the settlement was given the name Dorchester. By 1715, because of a clash between cultures, resulting in many wrongs done between both parties, the Yemassee, Creek, and other tribes began attacking English settlers. These attacks on settlers resulted in not only murder, but torture. This upheaval spread throughout the Low Country. In order to survive, settlers fled behind the walls of Charlestown. In 1716, the Goose Creek Militia was called up to Fort Ponds, not far from Dorchester. The militia was a ragtag assembly of 200 locals that had refused to run and probably included people from nearby Dorchester. These men were led by Colonel George Chicken, and because of their heroics, they fought the Yemassee War until there was no threats left. By 1719, the people of Dorchester finished building what they called the St. George Anglican Church. As their beliefs were so strong in reverence, the church was built on the highest ground, and the town of Dorchester was established around it. The land was divided to create a New England-style township, which had farm lots, a commons, a mill site, and a place for trade. In fact, the land was divided into 116 town lots, as well as the marketplace. By 1751, the congregation added the iconic bell tower, which the site is known for today. Dorchester was able to quickly establish itself by its agricultural prosperity. In fact, in its heyday, it was a thriving, buzzing hub of commerce. The people living here not only utilized the river to trade with Charlestown, but they also did a lot of trade with the indigenous people. Today, it's hard to believe such a religious group of people would want to impinge on the rights of others. However, prior to 1720, the hot commodities being taken to the port of Charlestown included rice, animal skins, fruits, vegetables, lumber, turpentine, pitch, tar, livestock, and human flesh in the form of native slaves. In fact, prior to that year, the number of Native Americans being exported far surpassed those coming in from Africa, the West Indies, and Barbados. However, during and after 1720, around 1,000 slaves were being imported to Charleston annually. Astonishingly, by 1770, it was more than 3,000 enslaved people arriving annually in the Low Country. Unfortunately for the Dorchester settlement, even with the use of slave labor, the people who lived here 
and in other areas of the state, still lived far from an easy life. This was due to the continual fear of a slave uprising, the French, the Spanish, and the Native Americans. In 1757, during the French and Indian War, it was decided Dorchester should build a powder magazine. This was done as it was felt wise to have additional powder stored elsewhere beside Charlestown as a safeguard. Dorchester was chosen as this place because there were several decent roads connecting Dorchester to Charlestown. In addition, at high tide, the Ashley River could accommodate ships as large as a two-mast sailing vessel, which could quickly navigate and transport gunpowder if needed. Initially, the powder magazine and its walls were designed to be built entirely of brick. However, because of the availability of oyster shells and lime, tabby fort walls were erected instead. This powder magazine, which gained the name Fort Dorchester much later, was described as being an oblong brick structure at the center of the fort's eight-foot-high tabby walls. In its original state, the tabby would have had a fresh white color and been finished off with a layer of stucco to create a nice smooth surface. However, today it shows signs of wear. By 1760, the magazine fort was completed and luckily no invasions from the French occurred. And the French and Indian War ended shortly after in 1763. The French and Indian War, also referred to as the Seven Years' War, nearly doubled Great Britain's national debt, leading King George III to logically conclude that he could cover at least some of his expenses by taxing the colonialist that the Redcoats had fought to defend. However, this taxation without representation was more than the people were willing to bear, and another war was the result. In preparation of the impending Revolutionary War, the little town of Dorchester was transformed into a military depot, and American troops assembled in the town. During the Revolutionary War, Fort Dorchester's commanding officer at one time was Francis Marion, who, after Charlestown was captured by the British in 1780, fled from Dorchester and took to the swamps. While in the swamps, Marion and his men waged a successful guerrilla campaign against the British. On the contrary, Fort Dorchester and its namesake town were taken over by the British and Loyalist troops until December of 1781. However, by that year, the British and Loyalist troops at Fort Dorchester were driven shrieking into the swamps by American troops under General Nathaniel Green. After the Revolutionary War, the town of Dorchester never recovered. People began moving to the nearby town of Somerville. This is believed to have been a result of the British who destroyed homes as they departed. However, it could have also been due to malaria, which caused people to flee for higher ground that had better drainage. During this time, the Fort Dorchester magazine was converted into a climb, where clay roofing tiles were produced for the newer homes being built in surrounding areas. In addition, some people began taking bricks and other materials from the abandoned structures in Dorchester. In 1788, a traveler wrote, I passed Dorchester where there are remains of what appears to have once been a considerable town. There are remains of an elegant church and several well-built homes. 
How was this passerbyer to realize that this now ghost town had actually existed for a hundred years as a successful small trade community? At 9.50 p.m. on August the 31st, 1886, residents of the port city of Charleston experienced a large-scale earthquake which resulted in the death of up to 110 people and damaged nearly 2,000 buildings. During this earthquake, what remained of the bell tower was split in two and almost toppled over. In addition, the earthquake completely destroyed some of the structures still left in the town. By the time a generation of new people finally stumbled upon the overgrown and forgotten Dorchester, it was thought that it had been built by the Spanish. It was at this time that those locals who rediscovered it first called it Fort Dorchester. During the 20th century, the South Carolina Society of Colonial Dames attempted to prevent further damage by placing steel ties around the tower. These ties held the tower together for over 50 years until more permanent repairs were needed. Today, because of archaeologists and found documentation, we know some of the true history here, though things are still being discovered. While not much is known about those who built these structures that have stood the test of time, they are believed to have been built by enslaved peoples. Some information on those who were forced to work and live here include shoemakers Carolina and Prince, Tanner Simon, Copper Jimmy, and domestics Sarah, Ben, and Nancy, who lived within the town limits. In addition, documentation about plantation slaves named Mingo, Ishmael, and Tom, who came into town frequently to trade, have also been found, as well as information about the enslaved boatmen, Manuel, Dick, and little Tony. In 1969, the site was donated to the South Carolina State Park Service, and the town of Dorchester was listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. Today, at this site, you walk among the hidden graves and foundations of the homes of those who once lived here. While visiting the site, you can take a trail, which not only leads to some picturesque scenes of the Ashley River, but also to the ruins of the fort, which is the best example of a tabby fort in the United States. In addition, you can read informative plaques, have a picnic, fish, find geocache, see live archaeological sites, Take photos at the popular bell tower. Take a self-guided walking tour. Take an online graveyard tour. Look for wildlife and or go to seasonal events hosted by the park. To finish this video, I will be talking about some of the interesting people that I discovered were buried here. The oldest recorded grave is Mary T. Izzard. She was born in 1693 and died in 1730. She was around 37 years old and the daughter of Francis and Elizabeth Turgis. She apparently inherited land that would become part of the Cedar Grove Plantation. Walter Izzard was born in 1692 and passed away in 1750. He was around 57 years old and was born on the Cedar Grove Plantation within Berkeley County. He also received a considerable estate from his father. He owned not only a large plantation on the Ashley River, in addition, he also settled other areas in Colleton and Gainesville counties. 
On the coming of age in 1713, he was elected to the commons of Berkeley County and was the first commissioner of the newly created St. George. He was again elected to commons in 1734 and sat until 1738 for St. Bartholomew and was a commissioner of the peace for Berkeley County until his death. His son Thomas, who is also buried here, was Justice of the Peace for Berkeley County and elected to the Commons of St. George. His son John, who passed away at 25, is also buried here and before his death was on the grand jury in Charlestown in March of 1753. His son Walter became a colonel and it seems served for a long time as an officer in the provincial forces. His son Ralph was a captain in the Berkeley Regiment from 1750 to 1752 and was a commissioner of the peace for his county. He was elected in 1745 to the commons of St. George and St. Helena. While their last name meant nothing to me, they did marry into the Blake, Middleton, and Pinckney families. Daniel Blake is also buried here. He was born in 1731 and passed away in 1780 at the age of 49. He was the son of Sarah and Colonel Joseph Blake. He lived on the Newington Plantation. Louisa Hutchinson is also buried here. She is the first of four generations of Hutchinsons buried here. She died in 1797, shortly after giving birth to her son. She does have a broken tombstone. She was the consort of Mathis Hutchinson Esquire. She passed away when she was 43 years of age, and it is said that she was an admirable and affectionate wife, a tender parent, a sincere friend, and a humane mistress. Her last moments were sweetened with the reflection of a well-spent life. Her husband, Mathis Hutchison, who is also here, was born in 1746 and passed away in 1812 at the age of 66. During the Revolutionary War, he supplied provisions, and he was also later Justice of the Peace. He was appointed to build causeways or bridges over the Cypress Swamp as the Commissioner of Bridges and Roads in South Carolina. He also served in the House of Representatives for St. George and was a member of the state convention to ratify the federal constitution. Mathis was married five times and outlived each wife with the exception of his last wife. Louisa and Mathis's daughter, Louisa Housill, is also here. She was born in 1774 and passed away in 1814 at the age of 39. Her tombstone was only one of the tombstones damaged during Hurricane Hugo in 1989. Major Edward Hutchinson was born in 1797 and died in 1855 at the age of 58. Edward was born and later owned his family's plantation Traveler's Rest in St. George on the Ashley River. This plantation was originally acquired by his father, Mathis. He was an attorney and served as an officer of the militia. He was also the first mayor of Somerville and Hutchinson Square is named in his honor. The son of John George Sr. is here. He was born in the old town of Dorchester on the Ashley River in present-day Somerville. He passed away in 1799 at the age of 50. He either died in Dorchester on his plantation named Georgesville or possibly in Charleston and was buried in the same plot as his parents. In his will, he requested that a stone wall enclose the family plot and that wall remains even today. Dr. Steuben's Firth was born in 1782 in New Jersey 
and passed away in 1820 at the age of 38. <laughs> Interestingly, as a doctor, he experimented on himself to prove that yellow fever was not contagious. He inoculated himself about 20 times in different parts of his body with black matter discharge from the stomachs of his patients and several times with their blood or saliva. His work was mentioned in a medical repository and quoted extensively in Philadelphia. Rebecca Izzard Wright was born in 1779 and died in 1831. She was the daughter of Ralph Izzard. She died near Newberry's Courthouse while she was traveling to Greenville for her help. Charles B. Ladson was born in 1756 and passed away in 1833. He was 77 years old. He does have a tombstone and was a planner who acquired the site of Dorchester after the town was abandoned. If you are interested in learning more about the people buried here, I would suggest taking the graveyard tour or going to find a grave where I found this information. Let's go see if he's got any story, <coughs> stories he can tell us. Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. Yep, that's a boy. Just like you. Get play with me. We're, we're soldiers from way back when. Way back when. Mm -hmm. Oldie days. Oldie days. <laughs> Kind of the peak at two sides of this. We had this the uh, campaign side where we would have an established garrison. The established garrison would be a little bit more more comfortable. We actually have a tent we would share with the tent mates from us. It'd be too late when it'd be dark. This is as far as sailors could come in. From okay. Uh, well, I didn't even know they came up this far. Yep. So. Uh, the reason the fort is over there is because this was the end of the river. They were afraid about the French invading during 1757. Uh, but if you look over there where that building is, that's the bathrooms. Uh, that's where they actually used to build ships here. And they had like a whole entire port over there um, where ships would travel up here from Charleston, transporting goods back and forth. A lot of the... Uh, <laughs> Of the what you gonna do? Hit somebody <laughs> or put that down? Uh -oh. Honey, that's his bombs and, <laughs> and cannons and stuff. <laughs> it's okay to look. Don't mess with his stuff. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I forgot that the river's pretty big up parts. here. <laughs> yeah, this is uh -uh. Millard. He, he is. Uh, <laughs> it's just business cards. <laughs> he, he's after your treasure. Right. Yeah, I forgot. I got to tell you something. I want to go to the pirate fair. The pirate fair? Yeah. Just use they're your eyes. Yeah, they're, they're very camera greenish. Ooh. Oh, yeah, they have a beautiful, beautiful color. color. It's a bottle of, of beetles. You see that? Oh, that's not. That, see, they knew about um, infection, but they didn't know what like caused that. it with germs. So. A lot of these are purgatives, trying to release those, those bad humors. I, 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 and then bloodletting. Oh, Don't that's be so what close. I smell. In the breeze so game, I smell the pepper. Okay, that's oh, why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and this we have um, some elderberries. Um, um, well, that's one. one there. Can you have one You one? can just look. Oh, you can look at the jars. You can look. Just use your eyes. Just use your eyes. If you do, if you if you use a tight patch ball, you can get yeah. more accurate for longer than that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. But it's, you get um, the, it's it's just about oh, the okay, yeah. Check out. And I said, do the math. Okay, let's go look. Yeah. Y'all are too little for that. Hey, let's look. No, I'm not buying it. You're too little. You'll shoot your eye out. Good morning. You got a card? Hey, you got a card too? It's a card. Oh, so yeah, they're they're, they're interested in piracy here. All right. <laughs> it's just for looks. It's just for looks. Well, you can look through the magnifying glass. Look right at it. Look at the 
No, look. Look, at, look on the map. It's so supposed to make it bigger. Down so it goes down into it. See how it gets bigger? <laughs> Be careful. Oh. You're, right it's for the image. map. Like look right there at what that says, and you can see the little image. Oh, yeah. Let's see some boats. Ship. Transport ship for goods. Oh, very cool. Don't touch it. All right, boys, we've looked. enjoyed this video, please like it. And as always, thanks for watching.